Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for our latest Very Office Investor Briefing. Today we'll be showcasing Okapi Resources Limited. Okapi, which is listed on the ASX under symbol OKR and OTCQB under the symbol OKPRF, controls large high quality uranium assets in North America and intends to create value through accretive acquisitions, high impact exploration and project development amid a uranium renaissance. This is a company that's undiscovered by US investors, we feel. Although based in Australia, most of its portfolio of assets are in North America. As you probably already know, there's been much discussion about securing more uranium from North America for US energy needs. Okapi should benefit from this. Here today to present the Okapi equity story is the company's managing director, Andrew Ferrier. Andrew has more than 15 years of experience in both management, corporate finance, and principal investing roles in the global mining sector, and has significant knowledge and understanding of the North American uranium space, having been heavily involved in the development, permitting, and sale of the Reno Creek ISR uranium project in Wyoming. Reno Creek is now the largest permitted reconstruction ISR project in the USA. So without further ado, Andrew, please take it away. Thanks, David, and thank you everyone for joining the webinar as well. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to give you a, a brief update on everything about our carpet resources and what we plan on the next sort of 12 months. Let me just share my screen quickly here. Uh, is that working okay? Can you see the screen okay, David? No. Okay, sorry, All right, guys. There we go. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, just briefing through the presentation here, I can see a pretty standard disclaimer. Uh, and then moving on, I guess, what we're all about at Akapi Resources. Um, effectively, we're gonna portfolio of uranium assets in North America, we currently have, uh, Four assets, four uranium assets there already. We have three assets in the US. Um, we have a group of six projects up in the Athabasca Basin also. Um, we have a very clear strategy on what we want to achieve in the uranium space. We think it's very important that our assets are in North America. And I'll explain to you why the strategic reason about that is going forward and just effectively all to do with security supply and everything that's happening in the geopolitical environment at the moment. Um, our experience internally is largely to do with high, sort of high impact exploration. Um, we know how to sort of add pounds to the ground and really add value to the company. We also have a lot of experience in, in acquiring assets. Um, my background is in mining private equity, so that's where a wealth of my experience comes from. Um, and effectively, the team um, has changed a lot in the last six months. I joined Akapi back in December. 2022. So I've been in the role now for about uh, about six or seven months um, and I've brought on and changed the team out quite a fair bit over that period of time. We have a new directors on board. We have a new chairman, a new non-exec chairman, Brian Hill. Um, um, his background um, is obviously a very ex experienced mining executive. Um, he lives in Denver, Colorado. Um, he's, you know, been heavily involved uh, in the mining space over the last 30 years, was the ex CEO of Newmont. I got to know him very well in a previous role, um, and we, we obviously get along extremely well. Uh, this is a little bit more of about the background in the team. As I said, my background is in, in mining private equity. As David mentioned, I do have a lot of experience in the US uranium space. Um, in that role, we were, you know, we deployed a lot of money into the uranium space in the US, and particularly in Wyoming, and an asset called the Reno Creek ISR project, which we acquired of Strathmore in 2012 and effectively took that project all the way through the development curve through a lot of technical milestones, um, all the way through permitting. And then that project was sold to UEC, which is now a um, very one of the most established US uh, uranium, uh, so new term development. Uh, companies out there, we saw that to them in 2018. That became, you know, their starting asset in Wyoming. They've gone on to obviously build upon that more recently. 
uh, Letter Math based in Perth, um, is our Dips Director and company, company Secretary, been involved in the company for a long time. Alan Roberts is our, is our key sort of country manager. He's based in Wyoming, which is a great place to be. 30 years of experience on the, in the US uh, managing drill programs. So that's a, a huge um, advantage for us. Also brought on board Jim Villeneuve, who was working with me on this right now, Craig Cassett. He was actually leading the charge and responsible for everything that was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. 40 years of experience in the US, which is you know irreplaceable in today's environment. This is our corporate snapshot, relatively modest market cap at the moment of $25 million Aussie, very tight share structure, 117 million shares outstanding. Um, cash in the till as of 31 March was $2.4 million. We have recently completed a, a small raising of another $2.5 million, which was completed early last week. That was extremely well supported, not only from existing shareholders, but also from new retail and institutional channels or to get into the story. And these, these are our four projects and it's probably easy to show these on the map on the next page, but basically a key sort of cornerstone asset is our Tallahassee project in Colorado. Um, we've got an existing resource on that project of 50 million pounds, which in US terms is a very substantial resource already. We've got a clear strategy on how we want to build upon that and grow that grow that resource base. Um, the graded deposit is very good at 540 ppm. Um, when you compare that to not only other assets in the US, but um, more so when you compare it to assets in, in Australia and Africa, uh, Tallahassee drill sheets has been well noted up for a long time and a huge amount of uh, historical drilling and money has been spent on that project, which we have the, you know, the benefit of having all that information at hand today. We also have our six assets in the Athabasca Basin. We've got geos in the field there at the moment, completing our summer field program. We hope to get boots on the ground on five out of those six projects in the coming weeks to months. And that's just basically teeing us up for hopefully a drill program this coming North American winter and where we see the highest priority targets. We also have two other assets. Uh, they're Rattler and Maybell. Uh, I'll show you them on the, on the next slide um, to show you exactly where they are. The Tallahassee's in Colorado, southeast of Denver, uh, about 140K southeast of Denver. Maybell is in the sort of southwest, uh, north, West corner of Colorado as well. It's a project we picked up quite recently. We effectively went out there and staked it, um, you know, which hopefully gives you a bit of a feel about I know how an expertise actually physically on the ground in the US in terms of getting things done. And basically we are to stake a whole uranium district which have it in, you know, 5 million pounds of historical production on it. We also got our Rattler project, which is in the LaSalle district in Utah. LaSalle district to the game, um, historically has been pretty important. It's about 80 k's north of the White Mesa Mill. Um, the South District is effectively um, controlled by a company called Energy Fuels based out of Denver, uh, US listed. It also owns the White Mesa Mill as well. So we're in a pretty interesting position there. I'll, I'll run through the catalyst when I go through each of the, each of the projects in detail. I think the only thing that's really important to mention and even though the company is 100% focused on its uranium strategy in North America, we also have a, another gold project here in Australia, in New South Wales, which we're currently completing an 1800 metre diamond drill program on. Um, uh, the program's going uh, extremely well in terms of productivities. Um, and we're basically following up on drill results completed last year. They did about a, a 10 metre, 1200 metre RC program last year. And they had some tremendous, very high grade results on that project, which sparked a lot of interest in the story. So we're following up on that drill program. And I think that's an asset that's completely undervalued in the car Effectively, it's a gold asset in Iranian company. So post this drill program, we'll probably look to sort of crystallize value for our car shareholders and, and just maximize what that project is for our shareholders. I, I, I need to talk a little bit about uranium and where, and where we sit in terms of, I guess, the cycle and where the uranium price is. But I think the most important thing to get across is just where are the markets heading? Uh, and the key thing to discuss there is that 
where the US sits in the, in the global dynamic of, of not only yellow cake, which is what the mines produce, but also enriched uranium. And effectively, the US is still, uh, so that's the world's biggest nuclear reactor fleet. It's got 92 reactors and they've operated better and more efficiently. It still generates 20% of all US um, power demand um, and has so for a long time. Um, but what happened, what's happened on the other flip of the coin is that the domestic production of uranium has effectively dwindled to effectively nothing since 1980. Uh, so you still, so you've got the biggest, world's biggest nuclear reactor fleet, you've effectively no US production of uranium, uh, which wasn't an issue until the invasion of Ukraine. And then, well, the, you know, the Congress, Congress is, is starting to work out the 50% of all uranium that comes into the US effectively comes through Russia. Uh, a lot of that uranium is sourced out of Kazakhstan and it goes through Russia. And that's obviously a, a delicate situation to be in at the moment. And what you're hearing from a lot of different corners is that, you know, that's obviously unsustainable. Um, and there's obviously something that needs to be done. Biden and the administration obviously announced um, a few very interesting programs, obviously, sort of encourage domestic production of, of you know, US production of uranium. Um, one of them is setting up a strategic supply of uranium, which would also be very important. The plowing, you know, $6 billion into keeping the nuclear reactor fleet ticking along. And they've also recently announced and yet to be approved another program, which is going to be US $4.3 billion, which is effectively funding the domestic you know the purchase of domestically produced enriched uranium so if you have domestically produced enriched uranium you probably need domestically produced yellow cake to feed that enriched uranium and that's exactly what we're hoping to benefit from in our projects and be sort of on that craft for the next wave of u.s producers so the dynamics in, in the u.s for uranium have had never been better um Uranium has effectively been unloved asset probably since Fukushima in 2012. And I say that in a, in a positive sense that the, the whole sector has just been underinvested into, which effectively means that there's been no new real discoveries, obviously some in the Athabasca Basin, but in terms of real work going into the ground in the US, um, very little has been done over the last decade, which basically means there's, there's a huge supply deficit looming um, in the next two or three years, which means that uranium price must go up to incentivize supply. And that's effectively what we're setting up to leverage our shareholders for. This is a, a really simple um, peer comparison. These are um, ASX listed companies. Um, and obviously um, not all companies and projects are the same. There's obviously some differences, but I think as a, a very broad metric you can see here that with our existing resource at Tallahassee of close to 50 million pounds and you compare that to other companies on the ASX which have similar size resource bases, similar size grade projects. These other assets are probably a little bit more advanced. Well, we have a Tallahassee, but you can see that there's a big valuation disconnect here. And I think that's just purely a function of, of us one, getting the story out there and marketing it. Um, since I've joined, I've been very focused on um, developing strategy and working on the assets. And now we're far more focused on, you know, getting the word out there and marketing it. So we're a little bit of an unknown story at the moment, but I think that's going to change over the next three to six months. This is our Tallahassee project. This is sort of the key, a key overview, as I mentioned before, in Colorado, southwest of Southeast, so sorry, southwest of Denver, about 140 k's. We're in Fremont County here, uh, close to city, sort of Canyon City, which you can see there, the very south of the picture. Um, what you can see there in the top right hand corner is Kipple Creek, which has been a gold heat bleach project that's been around for decades. Um, gives you a sense for the mining that happens in the district. And what we have here, and what you can see in the blue, is the, the part of the Tallahassee district that Akapi has an ownership interest in. Um, the Taylor Board deposits to the north um, as an existing resource area of 23.8 million pounds, which in itself is a pretty big project.
But then we recently announced and was very well received by the market, a, a 51% option interest in this Hanson picnic tree deposit to the south. And Hanson deposit um, has been nearly, ah, as you'll see on the next slide, has been the focus nearly all the historical work in terms of um, what Cyprus did in the 1970s. That added, and when we did that Hanson transaction, that you know, uh, incrementally boosted our resource by 22.2 million pounds, um, very high grade, um, and got us close to that 50 million park, 50 million pound park, which is what really sets us up as having sort of critical size and mass and relevance here in the US. But I think what you can see from this map, most importantly, is just the size of the uranium districts and the amount of historic uranium mining that has occurred here, uh, both in which are a good size to have a real critical asset. Cool. So this is sort of a, a closer in snapshot of Taylor Boyer and the Hansing and Picnic Tree. And I think the key thing I'm trying to get across in this slide is just how much historic drilling has happened in this Tallahassee district. Over 2000 drill holes, you know, close to 350,000 meters of drilling. You know, the, the cost to replicate that today would be um, enormous. We obviously have benefit of a large amount of the data that exists on this asset. Um, Cypress effectively took this Hanson deposit, which you, can, which you can see down here, all the way through to a mining permit um, in the late 1970s, effectively going to do an open pit and underground on the Hanson deposit, which is the highest grades, the thickest mineralizations. And then three mile occurred in 1980. Um, they effectively walked away from the asset, but it gives you a good sense of the, the economics behind Hanson. Um, and, and just given the size of the project, how much interest there has been in, in this part of the world. Um, we, are, we obviously don't own the whole district at the moment. I think you know, picking up a 51% interest in Hanson Pink Tree was a good step in the process for us to continue to do that. And I think we'll continue to have conversations with, with the relevant parties to continue to pull in the, the missing pieces for us at the moment to sort of effectively own this district. We have the experience and know-how we think to, to continue to develop the project, but from a technical perspective and a permitting perspective. So I think people are more than happy to sort of have conversations with us in terms of what we want to do with the asset. I think for, for some context, when this was So that's Hi, Andrew. Hi, you lost me. We lost you there. Uh, I'm not sure what happened with your connection, but perhaps you can uh, just bring up your slide deck and pick up where you left off. Yeah, sure. Can you see the slide deck again? Yes. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so as you can see here, Hanson, sort of the sweet spot of the deposit, um, very good thick horizons. Uh, we had good recoveries with acid leaches. So everything here is set up to, you know, it looks what looks like an excellent deposit. Um, we've got a, um, a permitting process in front of us. Um, we've already got a state permit to complete work out here. We're about to embark on, on working with Fremont County um, and the local um, landowners um, and, and start those conversations. And I think we're, we're well set up to progress this asset at a rapid pace. Moving on from, from Tallahassee to the Athabasca Basin. Uh, this is obviously in Northern Canada. The Athabasca Basin is sort of the elephant country in terms of having the world's biggest 
highest grade uranium deposits. We picked up six assets in the Athabasca Basin earlier this year. We had a very clear strategy on what we're looking for. And what you can effectively see is that all these claims that we've picked up are on the, on the fringe of the basin. This allows us to drill into the basement rock with relatively shallow holes, which is, in, in, is really important. The basement rock is where the, the two of the most recent discoveries have been in the Athabasca Basin. So sort of a slight change in the geological thinking of where these big high-grade deposit, um, deposits are, are located. Um, we've worked very hard on these assets for the last six months. We've done a lot of sort of desktop work initially, just going through and, and pulling together all the information. We've done a lot of satellite imaging. We're now, now we're in the process of completing a summer, summer field program. We've got geos on the ground, which is very exciting to see. Actually just walking the projects, understand you know, the structural geology better, look at doing soil sampling, rock sampling, and just going out there and making sure that the targets we think are the highest priority uh, by looking at the work previously done on these projects sort of match up. Um, and that's a real important step in the process for us. Um, we don't want to, we, we plan on setting up ourselves to be able to drill, particularly at Noonan and Perch, which you can see up there in the, in the northeast. Um, uh, that, that looks like the highest priority for us um, at this point in time, and that's currently where our geologists are. So we're, we're very happy to be in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, it's a great place to be. Um, and we've sort of been very astute, methodical and calculated in, in the way we think about our assets and the way um, we'll build upon our, our portfolio here in the Athabasca Basin. Um, this is the Middle Lake project. Uh, this is probably the project um, that we had the most eyes on when looking at the acquisition. In just in terms of its neurology, it looks very, very interesting. It's only three k's away from the, the old Clough Lake mine, which Orono slash Arriva operated for, for a couple of decades, produced over 70 million pounds of uranium. Um, it's also very close to UEX's Shade Creek deposit, um, which is in a JV with Arriva as well. Um, there's a lot of sort of sniffs here on these free claims we have. Um, very interesting sort of boulder transfer grades of up to 17%, which is exactly what you're sort of looking for. You need to then go find the, the source of the uranium. Um, we've already got a, a permit to drill here. Um, we've started sort of discussions and introducing ourselves to the, to the First Nations group in this area, which is, you know, a truly important relationship for us at Akapi, and we continue to build on that going forward. But this middle aid project is, is very interesting. I think what's sort of come out and sort of probably been our highest priority going forward is our, our Noonan Lake project, which you can see here. It's a much bigger claim package that we have, um, far more continuous lane package as well. And there has been over 200 drill holes completed in this district in the past, which just gives you a sense of, you know, how much, uh, how much excitement there has been for this, this area. I think what you can take away from here is that a lot of the drilling today, today has been done sort of on the basin, on the unconformity, on the sandstone rock, and that's sort of a, a, a sort of, a, sort of a, an outdated isn't the right word, but sort of where the, the old historical thinking was in terms of where these deposits are. What we're focused on now is much more on the fringe of the basin out here to the northeast, looking to get into the into the basement rock itself. And that's effectively what we have on these, all these claims out here. There's actually two pretty interesting conductive trends that continue to stretch out here onto the, onto the basement rock. So we're, we're pretty interested here. Um, and we're just working through the section hours again to, to be able to drill here in North American winter, um, which is the, the time of year, which makes most sense. This is our Maybell project. Um, I touched on this before, but effectively we're able to lock down a pretty interesting uranium district um, for pretty minimal cost. We basically staked it ourselves. Um, had over 5 million pounds of production here previously. It was done as a heat leach, which is pretty interesting for us because our, our sort of our backgrounds and expertise is in ISR. What we're going for now is we're quite a huge amount of data on the project. We're just going forward and stitching that together. It looks like historically there's been very large resources here, which are historical resources. 
Uh, so we just need to pull together that information and work out what the next steps are. We're in conversations again with, with people that sort of own also own property in this district. Um, so I think we you can see some pretty rapid developments on this asset going forward as well. Our other uh, uranium asset is Rattler. Uh, as I mentioned, this is in Utah. We have two claims that are probably best shown on this on, on this slide here. We own Rattlesnake and Sunny Sale, which you can see is on the West and Fringe of the District. Energy fuels uh, through previous uh, companies that is now acquired, we have had mines here extensively in the past. And as most recently as 2007, effectively doing some vanadium mining. So this has got a very strong vanadium credit in this entire district. We did a bunch of field programs here in December, January, six months ago, got some very high sample um, rock, rock chip samples back for, for both uranium and vanadium, which we announced the market. Um, so it's obviously a very high grade district in the US. Um, and these claims we've got out, we've already got a permit to drill. Uh, we drill up to 100 holes here. And we're just working through that at the moment. Drill rig availability in the US is, is, um, is it's a very busy time in the market. So we're just working through that at the moment. But this is an asset we, we really like and probably look to consolidate on as well going forward. So there are our sort of four key uranium assets. And this is sort of the last slide in the deck, but it goes back to our gold project in Enmore. And I, I think this, pro, this slide just basically shows, you know, what, what the potential of this Enmore project is. Uh, last year when they drilled, drill hole six and RC hole, it was 174 metres at 1.83 grams from, from surface, which is not a drill result you see every day. Uh, very interesting high grade portions in there as well. I think most interesting to us was that the last three metres were at eight grams. Uh, we're very focused on the drilling we're doing now and sort of targeting that, that high grade zone at depth to really understand sort of the depth and sanctions here of what we call the sunny side east prospects, but also what the strike extent is here on, on this project. We think it's got a lot more legs to it uh, we're in the process, and hopefully we're in the process of proving that to the market with the additional drilling that we're working on. Um, I think it's important to note that that 174 metres, 1.83 grams, wasn't true depth. We think that was sort of done parallel to strike down dip into the mineralisation. So an important part of the process of what we're doing now is sort of stepping back and drilling perpendicular to that mineralisation to get a better feel for the true widths. But any time you have sort of those grades, especially, you know, the last three metres, uh, that I mentioned. There's obviously a pretty continuous um, uh, gold mineralization here with some pretty high grade shoots in it. So we just need to understand this deposit better. We get a lot of inbounds. I think people see this as potentially a, a little bit of an orphaned asset in our in our portfolio since we are 100% focused on, on the uranium business. Uh, but I think this is an asset with which we can hopefully derives from really good value for shareholders by completing this program um, and seeing where it goes from there. And this is the last slide. It's, it's a bit of a summary slide, but hopefully you can see um, that we've got the right team to execute on the strategy. My background, Brian Hill's background as chairman, uh, I brought in Jim Villanay from the Reno Creek asset, which was the uranium asset in Wyoming, which was an ISR projects. So we've got a really good, nimble, small team. They're very cohesive and work together. We've got guys in the ground in the US, even though I'm based over here in Sydney, Australia. I spend a lot of time over in the US working with the assets. Nuclear energy uh, is, is in a resonance period. It's, you know, the only way effectively to have, you know, base load, uh, you know, net zero power. There's no other way to, to talk around that. Um, and the US is the place to be. It's in, it's in a bind at the moment and needs to incentivize domestic production of uranium. And that's exactly where we sit to help, to help them uh, achieve that. So that's why we're so excited about having assets both in the US and that's what our focus has been uh, going forward. I think over the next three to six months, we've also got a huge amount of catalysts. We've got our drilling and emblem. We'll get our programs up in the Alpha Basket Basin. We've got a clear strategy on what we want to do at Tallahassee. So we're working very hard on, on numerous assets. Well, I think it's going to be 
a huge amount of news flow sort of at least over the next three to six months and that's as far out as we've essentially planned at this point in time. Um, so thanks for listening to, to the webinar. I hope that gives you a bit of more insight about Akapi and what the plan is going forward. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for that overview. Um, what we are going to do now is turn this over to the Q&A portion. And for our viewers, uh, there's, there's two ways that you can interact if you have any questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. You can click on that and uh, type in any questions that you have for Andrew. Um, alternatively, if you'd like to be heard, you can click on the raise hand button and uh, I'll be able to turn on your microphone and allow you to have an audio interaction. So uh, please feel free to do either one of those. Um, okay, so um, we have a question. Uh, and the question is, please provide some more background on what is happening in the US uranium space, given the recent announcements by the Biden administration. Yeah, thanks, David. I think um, I touched on a little bit in, in the presentation, but it's a really important background um, and dynamic that's happening right in front of us as we speak. I think this slide just has a few snapshots of the, of the news articles that were recently announced. But basically, um, Biden and the Biden administration has put forward a, a proposal to Congress that effectively seeks to, to fund US $4.3 billion to help accelerate the domestic uranium industry, right? They understand that the predicament they're in where they're basically completely reliant on foreign uranium. And in particular, 50% of that comes through Russia. So that's also not a, a helpful dynamic for the US at the moment, a pretty dangerous one, I guess, for the US utilities that are, are currently sourcing the uranium from the US. I think, I think one since the invasion of Ukraine, there's been a lot of discussion about what the US is going to do. They were very quick to ban um, the importation of oil, gas and coal from Russia, but they didn't do it for uranium. I think the reason they didn't do it for the uranium is effectively because the US was just not well positioned to, to source uranium from anywhere else from Russia. And this is effectively what they're trying to do um, through these programs that they're announcing. It's, it's billions of billions of dollars and it needs to go into the ground in the US. And I think there's a real fear in the US that Russia might turn around and just say, no more uranium from us, right? Sort of flip the coin a little bit. And I think, I think the US is sort of rushing and pushing lawmakers to, to to get up and actually solve this problem before it becomes any bigger. Very interesting. Um, okay, next question. Where do you see the uranium price going? Uh, it's a good question. Uranium price is, um, is, a, is a little bit soft at the moment relative to, to, I guess, where it was sort of September, October last year. But I think whenever I think about where the uranium price is going, I always come back to incentive pricing. So at the, main, at the moment, the spot uranium price, which is only one, there's two sort of measures of, of the uranium price, there's long-term contracts and the spot price. A lot of people focus on the spot price, even though it's uh, a far smaller market in terms of the actual pounds that are contracted. Uh, but it's one that's a lot more visible to the market, so hence the focus. Uh, the spot price at the moment is, is in the mid 40s and that's just completely unsustainable going forward because effectively um, that just doesn't incentivize new production into the market. So if you see uh, on the presentation here on the right, um, you can see there's a deficit coming uh, in the next couple of years and that deficit can only be filled if new production comes back into the market. And for new production to come back in the market, I think you need to see a uranium price of 
of north of US $65 per pound. So that's obviously a long way away from where we are now. Um, and that's just effectively just market economics, right? Until the uranium price gets up to those higher levels, you're just not going to see this little supply deficit fixed. Um, so the market needs to move and I think it'll move quite rapidly. Okay, uh, next question. Is it likely that Okapi will acquire the remaining 49% of the Hansen deposit? Um, I, I, I think it's a... I think I've been relatively sort of open in sort of what our aims and intentions are in, in that district. We're also, we're, we're in there extensively already. I think we're looking and we'll explore all options on how to further consolidate that district. But in terms of where we go and where our discussions with our other parties, I think they all see um, commercial discussions. And I think, um, I, you know, I, I hope that we can, work with all the other parties in the district and sort of work together potentially in the first instance to sort of make sure um, that the project in the district is advanced as it should be, given, given its sort of high quality nature. But in terms of commercial negotiations, we'll see where that takes us. Okay. Um, where do you see Okapi in the next 12 months? Yeah, thanks, David. I think I think we're also got four uranium assets uh, in the US. I think in terms of our gold asset, I think we'll we'll look to sort of monetize that asset as best we can, and, and it sort of depends on on sort of the drilling program that we're completing at the moment. But I think I think it make probably makes sense to either spin that project out or put in a new vehicle because we are hundred percent focused on on the uranium space in North America. So in 12 months, I think you'll see this obviously achieved a lot down at, at Tallahassee in terms of continuing to advance our projects. I think we've completed some, some really interesting drilling up in that Fasca Basin as well. We're very excited about our, our targets up at, at Newnham and Perch, which are up in the northeast of that Fasca Basin. And I think you'll see us get out a lot of interesting sort of news flow on both Rattler and Maybell as well. So we're working behind the scenes now, working for all the data on both those projects. And I think there's sort of a lot of other projects that we're looking at at the moment as well. We sort of are very picky in terms of unless they sort of fit in with our strategic direction, we're, we're pretty quick to say no. But I think there are a few interesting opportunities out there in the US trading market. And once that sort of fit our skill set very well in terms of, um, you know, permanent and ISR in the US. So if something like that comes along, we won't be shy to, to try and get our hands on it as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, next question. Um, would you please provide us with a little more background about yourself and the team? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so my background, I'll flick to the, the relevant slide. Um, my, my background, I'm a sort of chemical engineer. I was a metallurgist for four or five years um, working here in Australia. I joined a, a mining private equity firm back in 2008 and I worked for them for effectively 12, 13 years. Um, for a large portion of that, I was based over in North America, both in the US and Canada for sort of six or seven years. So I was very focused on looking at assets in the Americas, um, and in particular, as I mentioned, the US uranium space with the, the Reno Creek project, which was a, a big investment for the fund. So I spent a lot of time as, as sort of the private equity owner of that asset, um, managing everything that happens on the grounds in terms of the technical work, the permitting work, and then the eventual sale of the project to UEC. So that was a very interesting time in terms of it was a bit, it was a it was a dark time in the uranium space, sort of 2012 to 2018. But, you know, it meant that I, I knocked on a lot of doors, visited a lot of the projects in the US, had a lot of discussions with a lot of parties because we're all sort of working out how to best advance our projects because there wasn't much sort of outside generalist interest in the uranium space at that time. So it was a, it was a very good sort of learning ground uh, to understand the US uranium industry. Uh, the background to the rest of the team I touched on, Brian is you know, unbelievable experience in the US and abroad was based in 
Australia for a period of time as well. He's done, um, you know, more more deals in, in sort of junior mining M&A space than most people. He knows what does and doesn't work in, in the space and he's very, um, very focused on us having a very clear direction on what we want to do and staying on track. Um, Alan Roberts and Jim, sort of the two key technical guys on the ground in the US for us, um, huge man experience, um, works with Jim very closely on the Reno Creek process for a period of five, six years. So we know each other extremely well. And when I joined the car policy, he was very quick to, to ask Jim to come on and sort of work with me closely on, on the Tallahassee, well, all the projects, but also looking at new projects as well. Okay. Uh, we have another question here. Are there any significant obstacles for an Australian based company like Okapi trying to compete in the States? No, I don't, I don't think so. And I think I say that from um, a point of view of um, we're very connected into the US uranium space. I think if it was an Australian company just coming to the US for the first time and trying to start from zero um, in the US uranium space, I could see that being quite difficult in terms of working out the different projects, the permitting um, and all the different sort of nuances, which which occur even on a state to state level in the US. I think given my background and the team's background with Brian, Jim and Ben as well as our, our director, I think we have you know, so much US experience and effectively you know, three of those four guys are actually based in the US all the time. I lived over there for a period of time. So I think we have really good know-how on the ground and really good connections on the ground. So from a permitting point of view, I think we're, we're very good and um, just, just very clear in terms of um, talking to regulators and sort of respecting regulators in that process and going through and making sure we're very meticulous and thorough in, in, the, in, the, in the work that we provide. So I think it's just our experience and how it means it even though we're an ASX listed company, we effectively think of ourselves as, as being on the ground in the US. Um, okay, great. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q and A. Um, so I think uh, that is it for today. So Andrew, um, thank you so much for providing this overview to our investors. Uh, for our investors, a replay link will be available shortly and we'll distribute that out. Um, and it will also be uh, distributed via social media. So you'll have an opportunity to uh, rewatch uh, this presentation. So again, Andrew, thank you very much. And to our audience, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and hearing Andrew present. Thanks, Simon.